much, and thanks again for coming. You can hear me, obviously. Good. Uh, I'm Amy Jo Hawkins. I'm the coordinator of library services here at Charleston for College. And today, uh, we're here to welcome Christina Levin. This is actually part of the Carl Singer Festival that's going on all weekend in town. And um, she was actually born here in Galesburg, but she's lived and worked all over the states, and it's pretty varied. She's been to Indiana, Maine, Ohio, North Carolina, and her home is now in Central Kentucky. Uh, her education is just as varied. She began school at Anderson University. She's been to ICC. She's also been to some Harvard summer programs, and that all culminated into her Master of Fine Arts degree in creative writing, and that was from New England College. So all of those careers um, led her to ending up teaching writing courses at community college. So her writing has actually appeared in over 100 different literary journals and anthologies. She's actually the recipient of numerous poetry awards, writing res residencies, fellowships, and grants. And those are really easy to find if you go onto her website um, or just Google it. There's, it's just scrolling and scrolling and scrolling through all of these different awards that she's received. Um, some of the most notable ones that she has received is the 2007 Al Smith Fellowship from the Kentucky Arts Council and the Elizabeth George Foundation Grant. So please help me in giving a round of applause to Christina Levin. write my poems like a dog lives life. Muzzle deep in the rock of flesh and hair found in a far field. To wallow joyously in the stench of death, its heart remains worried until clean and white. And read the shit piles of life as if they were the New York Times or gateways to enlightenment. Stupid in my love, all eyes and tongue and tail. I would head into the path of fate, ears pricked, uncomplaining when its wheel rolls over me. Just glad to have had this day, this bit of sun and shadow, some hint of game on the breeze, a momentary hand resting on my head, a name to be called. Um, that poem is called Shadow. I was at my, um, I'm having surgery here in a few weeks, and my surgeon had found my book, this, this particular book, this one is A Stirring in the Dark, um, at Amazon, and so when I walked into his office, he said, your writing's very dark. <laughs> Are you kidding? <laughs> my doctor said, well, yeah. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the darker side of poetry. This is kind of my Ars Poetica, which means the art of poetry. Uh, you may be more familiar with Archibald McLeish's um, version. Um, there's another one, if I can find it quickly, um, that I like really well. It's uh, Dana Levin, who's a contemporary poet. This is her Ars Poetica. Cocoons. Six monarch butterfly cocoons clinging to the back of your throat. You could feel their gold wings trembling. You were alarmed. You felt infested. In the downstairs bathroom of the family home, gagging to spit them out, and a voice saying, don't, don't. So that's kind of why we're going to talk about the dark side of poetry. Um, and in particular, um, maybe some more protest type uh, poetry. This is not what I had planned to do today. I had something else totally planned, and this one, so I'm going in and out here. Uh, and uh, this, I don't know why this came to mind. Maybe there's somebody here who needed to hear this. I don't know. But uh, just a little bit about poetry. Verse is not necessarily poetry. Uh, I would say there are a lot of Hallmark cards out there that are not really poetry. And, uh, um, my ex-husband and I used to own some Hallmark shops, and so I know a lot about Hallmark cards. <laughs> I've uh, handled 
probably millions of them in the years that we had stores. And, excuse me, anyone can write verse. A child can memorize a nursery rhyme. You all probably remember some from your childhoods. Um, and pretty soon they can learn to rhyme words on, on their own. There are people being paid at Hallmark right now, as we sit here today, but only a poet can write true poetry. Um, what is poetry then? It's all the things that make up, that, that make up verse, rhyme, meter, metaphor, simile, Im imagery, but it's far more than that. Um, for me, it's the call of the poet and the response of the reader. To me, that's when, when it becomes art, is when um, it interacts with another person and it makes a connection between the poet and the reader. And, and a connection in which they agree or disagree about something. It's an engaged observation, often with three or more particular images that mesh together into a seamless whole. I uh, make little notes, sometimes on my phone, uh, sometimes it's just a few words or an image, and sometimes it takes a very long time before that image or those few words connect with something else to make a poem, and finally then it clicks. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about protest poetry. I think maybe, you know, the, the current, regardless of what side you're on, uh, there's a lot of controversy in our society today uh, on just about every level. So uh, maybe that's what I was thinking of. Protest poetry has been around as long as people have been writing. And if you, think, if you think it wasn't dangerous for poets to write against a king or a government, look around you today. There are poets in prison today just for writing poetry. Um, in some of the Middle Eastern countries, there have been a, there have been a few that have been um, executed just for writing poetry. So it is important. I'm gonna start back with World War I. Um, has anybody, has anyone heard of Wilfred Owen? You should check him out. Um, he was a British soldier in World War I. Uh, he ended up dying shortly before the uh, war was over, I mean literally weeks before. And uh, his famous poem is Dolce et Decorum S. Um, and I'll tell you what that means in a minute. You may know if you uh, speak Latin. Uh, does anybody even take Latin? No, I know you did. We, I did. I took two or three years of it. Preachers. Preachers. Yeah. Um, but I think it helped me understand a lot of vocabulary. But in his poem, he describes what he had seen um, during a gas attack on the soldiers, you know, a chemical warfare. And uh, it was on a, a group of inf infantrymen. And they would have to rush around and put on their, ga put on their gas masks. Maybe I should have had the put on their gas masks before the gas hit them or they would you know, die from it. Um, and he describes it in lurid detail. Um, and then it ends with the admonition that if everyone, particularly the people that were sending young people to war, if they could understand what actually happens on the battlefield, no one would be so quick to believe what he calls the old lie, dolce est decorum est pro patria mori. Anybody know what that means? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, I got the is of the father. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, basically, he's saying he's calling the old lie. It is good and sweet to die for one's country, um, and he's saying that it. Uh, you know that if, if you could really see so that I mean that's I've not been to war I've not been to war although all four of my brothers were involved in one or more wars in their lifetime uh, they're all four of my five brothers are um, buried in Knoxville and each one has at least one war on listed on their tombstones so I can't really comment on war uh, what happens there but when someone with first-hand knowledge presents the facts, I feel I must listen. So that's World War I. Then we'll go on to World War II. Uh, Kenneth Patchen was kind of uh, 
bridged World War I and World War II. He was kind of with the Beats, but he was a little bit before them. Um, and by the Beats, I mean Alan Gettysburg and um, Lawrence Roman Getty and, and that group. And his poems are more gentle, but with a little hook. So this is Instructions for Angels by Kenneth Patchen. Take the useful events for your tall, red mouth, blue weather, to hell with power and hate and war. The mouth of a pretty girl, the weather in the highest soul. Put the tips of your fingers on a baby man, teach him to be beautiful, to hell with power and hate and war. Tell God that we like the rain and snow and flowers and trees and all things gentle and clean, white winds, golden fields, to hell with power and hate and war. Um, another person who wrote during World War II um, and after was Muriel Rupeiser, who not only wrote protest poetry, but went to Korea to help free a jail poet there and traveled to the South to aid in the defense of men who had been falsely accused of a crime there. Um, and then in Vietnam, there were, of course, there was tons of protest songs. Um, and I, I teach college, by the way. I have a, right now about 130 students. Um, I teach at a university. And uh, I'm constantly ad admonishing my students you know, I think, like, why aren't you guys out there protesting like we did, you know, in the 60s? We were, we were out there doing it. And, and I see that in the last year or so, I, I believe there's more people becoming involved. Uh, but Yusuf Komanyaka was a soldier in Vietnam, and one of his famous poems, I'm not going to read it, it's called Facing It, which is about a soldier visiting the Vietnam Memorial Wall for the first time. And I believe it's him even though you should never assume that a poem is autobiographical. Um, but it's a really moving poem, and if you Google, if you, want, if you want to know how to spell his name, let me know. But you can Google it and hear him read it. Um, it it's a really moving poem. Another friend of mine, Doug Anderson, who's still writing about Vietnam, and he's older than I am, and he can't stop writing about Vietnam. During the Gulf War, Brian Turner who was a soldier and became a poet, has a famous book of poems called Here, Bullet. And it sounds like it's about a dog. Here, Bullet, it's not. It's, a, it's about, a, that's a real bullet. Um, then 9-11 happened. And um, I'm not gonna read the poem I wrote that day. I was living in Peoria at that time. And I do remember that night very well. If you were of any age at all, you will. But a year later, um, I was going to a very well-planned ecumenical memorial service. There would be Muslims and Catholics and Protestants and Buddhists. Um, I lived in Chapel Hill, North Carolina at the time and was talking to a friend in Kentucky. And um, I said, this is what I'm doing tonight, September 11, 2002. And I said, what are you doing? What are you doing today? And he said, well, I mowed yesterday, he's a farmer, I mowed yesterday and it's a drought here and it's windy and clear and the hay's already dry and I'm going to be bailing hay today. And I thought, wow, what a wonderful thing to be doing, to be close to the earth and not have to think about all the uh, wreckage and carnage. And the very next words out of his mouth were, I haven't cut the feed from off one rabbit. And I, I was a little stunned, and I said, does that really happen? And he went on to tell me his stories about baling hay, cutting and baling hay. And uh, there's a saying among poets that sometimes the angels come towards you and just hand you a poem. And that's pretty much what happened here. I changed virtually nothing after I wrote the first draft of this poem. It's called This Day in Particular, September 11th, 2002. You mowed the mare's field yesterday because the sky was clear, the air dry, and would be so for days to come, or so the farmer's almanac had claimed. 
Today the baler swept the field of loosely mounted timothy and clover, swirling up and over, tidying the strewn field, leaving only stubble. I haven't cut the feet from off one rabbit, you say. I hear the echoes of your mother's hills in the modulation of your voice, as you tell me of the time a sucker snake was caught up, bound into a bale, dying there, and how the hay pressed around the rotting flesh would have decayed. So you spread and fed it fresh to mares and foals that leaned the fence beside the barn. You tell me that too many horses spoil attractive grass. Their droppings soil the hay, rendering it inedible and sour. You say there is a man you know who sheared the legs from off twin fawns. Hidden in the tall grass, startled to a run, they skittered from the tractor's wheels, only to meet the mower blade eight feet to the side. How he didn't have a gun but in plain sight of his grandsons, seven, five, he hammered the dear skulls to death's mercy. But today, not one rabbit, snake, or fawn, no small child to witness, only firm, fresh bales that wait to be unbound and split to ease winter hungry bellies of animals held stamping in their stalls or snowbound in the fields. And in that cold, the fragrance of September's grass will rise like prayer. And you will not remember this day in particular. Just the rest that comes at the end of the sweat. These blameless bales tower to the haymow's rafters. The sacred smell of the living creatures. The blessed soil. Um, and um, that's, that poem has been published probably more than any of one of their poems. Um, then, about six months later, March 19, 2003, um, we decided to go to war based on some things that may or may not have been true. Um, but anyway, we were there. Um, this poem I did write that day. It's called The Village Burns. I remember the mouse I killed with a summer sandal. I hit it again. I hit it again. It was half the size of a silver dollar, the color of nickel, with clean, delicate fingers, curling into itself like a closed fist, a dot of oily blood filling the cup of its ear. Somewhere today, a village burns. A tree is bursting with bloom outside my window. The creek across the street overflowed from hard rain last night, flooding fields where children play soccer, flashing lights on barricades, worn cars away from deep water. This morning, I heard a mocking bird, familiar sound, but not a song I recognized. An ambulance wailed out on the bypass a few blocks away, and I knew the bird has learned it because he's heard that sound so often. No one around me mentioned the war today, but that damn tree is bursting with blossoms. I can't bear to look at it, but I remember the mouse I killed with one of my summer sandals. That was 1968. I never wore them again. Uh, within, if, um, I, I, if you went onto my Facebook page, you would see that probably 90% of the people on there are other writers or poets, uh, some academics, a few family members, but uh, I felt like I found my tribe when I really embraced writing. Um, and that was one of the reasons I decided to take classes at Harvard was because I wanted to take my writing seriously. But within three weeks of the start of the Afghan War in 2003, Poet Sam Hamill started a website as a repository for poets to turn in their, their uh, protest poems. And it's called Pro Poets Against the War. Within three weeks, there were over 25,000 poems posted there. It's important. People need that expression, and people need to read it, too. Uh, today, it seems that we're being bombarded daily from all sides by issues that affect us all 
environmental issues, gender issues, military aggression, refugee, situa refugee situations on several fronts. And um, I will answer some questions if you have questions. But I'm going to leave you by a poem by Morrison Shire. Does that name sound familiar to anybody? Okay, if it's, if it's not familiar, some of her words should be. Uh, as Beyonce used some of them in her recently released album, Lemonade. Um, so this is called Home. It's a poem about refugees. It's by Warson Shire. No one leaves home unless home is the mouth of a shark. You only run for the border when you see the whole city running as well. Your neighbors running faster than you, breath bloody in their throats. The boy you went to school with, who kissed you dizzy behind the old tin factory, is holding a gun bigger than his body. You only leave home when home won't let you stay. No one leaves home unless home chases you, fire under feet, hot blood in your belly. It's not something you ever thought of doing until the blade burnt threats into your neck. And even then you carried the anthem under your breath only tearing up your passport in an airport, airport top toilet, excuse me, only tearing up your passport in an airport toilet, sobbing as each mouthful of paper made it clear that you wouldn't be going back. You have to understand, no one puts their children in a boat unless the water is safer than the land. No one burns their palms under trains beneath carriages. No one spends days and nights in the stomach of a truck feeding on newspaper, unless the miles traveled mean something more than journey. No one crawls under fences. No one wants to be beaten, pitied. No one chooses refugee camps or strip searches where your body is left aching, or prison, because prison is safer than a city of fire, and one prison guard in the night is better than a truckload of men who look like your father. No one could take it. No one could stomach it. No one's skin would be tough enough. The go home blacks, refugees, dirty immigrants, asylum seekers sucking our country dry. They smell strange, savage, mess up their country, and now they want to mess ours up. How do the words, the dirty looks, roll off your back? Maybe because the blow is softer than a limb torn off. Or the words are more tender, or the insults are easier to swallow than rubble than bone, than your child's body in pieces. I want to go home, but home is the mouth of a shark. Home is the barrel of a gun. And no one would leave home unless home chased you to the shore, unless home told you to quicken your legs. Leave your clothes behind, crawl through the desert, wade through the oceans, drown, save, be hunger, beg, forget pride. Your survival is more important. No one leaves home until home is a sweaty voice in your ear saying, leave, run away from me now. I don't know what I've become, but I know that anywhere is safer than here. Uh, so uh, I don't know that person's background, but it's also a very heartfelt poem. And I believe you all know what woke means. Anybody doesn't know what woke means? <laughs> Be woke. Be it. Do it. We're all connected. It's not just humans, it's the land, it's animals, humans. See what is happening around you and write about it. Try and, you know, if you don't try, you can't do it. And if it's not good the first time, do it again. Uh, uh, does anybody have any questions about anything? Actually, okay, probably sure. Probably a couple, but one that really was good, I wanted to know, How did you go about getting published first? Oh, okay. Um, I've been, well, actually, I've had a lot of things published under a name no one knows. Uh, <laughs> no, but they weren't very good, and I'm just leaving it that way. And oddly enough, <laughs> oddly enough I got paid for all of those, but they weren't very good. Uh, it wasn't until I, when I moved to Maine in 1994, um, I'd always written. I've been, I've been running my entire life since I was a little child. Um, and when I moved to Maine in 1994, I started um, being exposed to 
writers who were writing more contemporary stuff, and um, you know, I realized that what I was writing was not very good. <laughs> um, and in fact, when I one of the classes I took at Harvard in the summer of 2000 was a poetry class. My teacher, or the professor, instructor, whatever, uh, was Bruce Smith, who that year was a, both a Pulitzer and a National Book Award finalist. He didn't win either one. He went also didn't win the National Book Award the next time he went out for it. But he's a wonderful poet and he's a great teacher. And, and I, I always feel like with my students, if they can take two or three things home that they can actually use, I'm happy. You know, there's a lot of stuff that's just gonna go, you know, down, down the drain. And uh, two things I, I learned that summer, one was to recognize bad writing, particularly my own, um, and the other, was that there are percentages of rhyme from 10% to 100%, uh, those were things. Um, so I started recognizing that my poetry was not that good. So that made me read more and learn more. And, and I started, um, I got, I had a few things published before I got my Master of Fine Arts, but since I've had my Master of Fine Arts, I've had like 250 individual pieces published. So that self-awareness is very important. Oh, yes, definitely. And, and you know, the quotes William Faulkner said, kill your darlings. You have to be willing to cut stuff. And um, another one, of, and I think y'all are invited, they're all invited if they want to come to the workshop on Saturday. Yes. Isn't it great for students? students are We're going to talk about some of that, but um, there's, uh, well, I heard someone one time said that when you think you're done with your poem, cut their it, there's there's so much you can get rid of that make things makes things move more smoothly and uh, more effectively. Um, does that answer that a little yeah. bit for you? Did you have another question? Um, well, was, uh, yeah, I just, what made you become a writer? I, I was, just, like I said, I was- Were you born that way? Or? I, I, I think I was, but I grew up listening to hymns at church and then uh, we had in our bathroom, for some reason, there was an ancient little tiny volume of Edgar Allan Poe's The Raven, which I memorized in my trips there. And uh, so I was probably 10. But I was writing poetry when I was 9 or 10. I think I had my first poem published when I was 10. They used to do Young America Sings. Does that sound familiar? It was like school kids could have some, turn stuff in. Um, but the summer I was at Harvard, I got something published in the Harvard Summer Review, which was, that was like, okay, may, maybe somebody will take me seriously now. Uh, and I wanted to take myself seriously. Um, but after, like I said, since I got my MFA, I've had a couple hundred plus five books. So that's, yeah, well, and that's been 13 years. It was 2004. I started late. I did start late. Oh. Uh, anybody else have a question? Yeah, yeah. Yes, ma'am. You said you learned how to recognize bad writing. How do you teach your students that? <laughs> um, they just have to look at good writing. <laughs> you look at this, and then you look at this, and okay. Yeah, you know, I, I think the best advice is to read, you know, go to the, the uh, Poetry Foundation or the Academy of American Poets. Go to those websites. Do not go to poetry.com. That is not good poetry. Um, and just look around. You can on uh, Poetry Foundation. You can search by um, the topic or by the age of the person and the age of the poet. Um, there's a really cool uh, video on there that I show my creative writing students called "Still Burning." It's about 20 minutes. It's kind of about it's um, about poet Gerald Stern, who just turned 92, I believe. And I, he, I tell him he's the Jewish father I never had. My dad was a Swede, I'm from Galesburg, so. Um, a lot of people's dads were Swedes. Um, and it's about how, like he calls it still burning. It's when, when he says like when poetry took over his life and it was like the red coal and once you start that you can't, you can't put it away. And I think a lot of people and I've shared this with uh, friends who are writers and poets, a lot of us don't write because we want to, we write because we have to. Because 
you know, we're always writing stuff down and putting little papers and, you know, gum wrappers with ideas on them and napkins and, and it's just constantly going. Does that, does that help yeah, a bit? Yeah. Reading good poetry, good contemporary poetry, um, and, um, you know, just read it. And go, I'm sure they have a library <laughs> uh, um, If anyone's really, really interested, you could, um, I, I, my first met faculty mentor when I got my MFA was Leon Lee, and I don't know if anybody knows who he is, but you should know who Leon Lee is. His father was Mao Zedong's personal physician, and then they had to leave China, and he's off on another planet with his mind, but his poetry is just crazy good. Um, and I was lucky to work with him, although he told me, um, I don't think this is a poem. He would say, I don't think this is a poem. Yes, sir. This is a two-part question. Do you uh, like, do you write short stories too, or just? Um, I do. Uh, I've not had a lot published. I have one story that's been a finalist in two national competitions, but it's never been published. It's actually based on something that happened in Galesburg, but I changed where it was and what it was. I wrote it three ways, and finally I decided I couldn't write about it the way it really was. And um, um, what happens in the story is uh, a mother who had been molested by someone that she knew finds out her daughter's being molested by the same person, and she goes biblical on this. If you go to the Old Testament, there you've got some pretty harsh, harsh penalties there. Uh, yeah. Second part. Uh, so, do you find one more difficult than the other writing poetry? Or writing um, poetry? Well, it's faster to write a poem. <laughs> that's yeah. one. That's with the poetry. You know, I can. My my books are not that long, but uh, yeah. Uh, I do like writing short stories. I like creating nonfiction too. Memoir. I've been told I should write a memoir, but I said a few more people have to die. <laughs> you have to be careful. <laughs> I think we're yeah, you're close. Are we close? Yeah. Okay, oh. we're gonna have to go. But if you have, um, there are little things over here that have my website on them. Or I, I teach at Eastern Kentucky University. You can find me there if you have more questions and email me, and I'll answer them. Okay. Thank you.